This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. I discovered It Follows during the COVID pandemic, back when my friends and I would get together in a voice call and watch movies together just to stave off the insanity. I'd heard great things about the movie, but knew very little about it, and man, even now it's one of the best horror films I have ever seen. Most of us have heard of It Follows by now, and I'm sure the assassin snail theory jokes have been done to death, so I'll just be quick and clean about this. As simply as possible, a victim is pursued by a phantom assassin, a physical, tangible, but invisible to everyone else, creature that knows where they are at all times, and exactly how to get to them. The victim does not know what the creature is going to look like, being that it changes forms between sightings. You might see your dad walking towards you, but when you run around the corner, you might find it's changed to look like your mum, meaning that you're never sure whether the person walking towards you is the creature itself or just a random person going about their day. I mean, no one likes being followed, and in the age of the internet it's harder than ever to stay safe, especially online, and that's why today's sponsor is Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN keeps your online identity safe by encrypting the information sent between your device and the internet, protecting your personal data from anyone, from cyber criminals to big companies. This is especially useful when you're using those dodgy free public Wi-Fi spots, but you also really need to check when your train is due, allowing you to make use of a public good without putting yourself at risk of hackers. The clean web feature even blocks ads, trackers, malware and phishing attempts, allowing you to surf the web safely. Surfshark can also mask your IP address, ensuring that your city, country and download history aren't linked to your identity. That's going to be between you and the hub. Furthermore, for the safety conscious, Surfshark doesn't monitor, track or store what you do online. You browse safe and free with Surfshark. Use the code MERTKK to get an extra three months free and remember that Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee, so take the time you need to test it and know that you can cancel at any point in that first month if you need to for full money back. Check the link in the description to learn more. Now, let's get back to the video. It Follows features a creature which cannot physically be stopped, only ever slowed. And it also possesses basic logic and common sense, able to discern whether you're trying to trap it and how you're trying to trap it, as we see towards the end of the movie when our main cast try to knock it into a pool so that they can throw plugged in toasters at it in an effort to kill it. The creature just looks around, assesses the situation and then just starts lobbing the appliances in the pool itself instead. Furthermore, when the creature reaches you, it will kill you violently. The few victims we see see throughout the film are smashed to bits in a matter that demonstrates to us that their death was probably not as fast as you'd hope for in a situation like this, like it's a lot of snapped limbs. The way you pass this creature on is by having sex with someone, a feat worth an Olympic medal. Considering the immense pressure you'll likely feel yourself under to transmit the creature again, I can't imagine how hard it is to get it up at that point, you'd need to thumb that in. Often, as we see throughout the course of this movie, this is done without warning the individual of the consequences of what's about to happen. This movie is all about trust and intimacy and how easily those things can be erased with a good old fashioned bit of deception. Yummy, yummy deception. At this point, the creature will now be visible to the person you've passed it on to, plus you, plus anybody else in the chain. You can use that to coordinate your approach or try to escape together. The only issue is that once the creature gets its hands on whoever you've lumped them with and kills them, they'll start pursuing you now again too, moving back down the queue. There are quite a lot of rules clearly laid out to us about how this creature works across the length of the film. For example, it's a one-to-one -one transmission. You can't cue a bunch of victims by having sex with a bunch of people. This is a murderous supernatural hot potato and you can only pass it on when you are holding onto it yourself. This is one of those movies that doesn't bother to fill in the gaps either. So if you had a question like, does it count for any kind of sex or specifically just P and V or do you need to orgasm for it to count? Or what would you do if the situation was different? It follows is like, fuck you, figure it out for yourself. So this is a horror movie. What's the horror? I mean, I can't imagine that anybody would be asking that considering the scenarios that have doubtlessly run through your mind already, but yeah, it is scary. This is horror in its purest form to me. It follows perfectly encapsulates inescapable horror. It's inevitable death. It's you have no choice but to go about your life. There's nothing you can do except pass it on. All you can do is hope that it never comes back and it's always going to come back. It Follows delivers two unique brands of horror to your viewing experience. One, the immediate horror. You are pursued by a monster that will rip you to shreds if it catches you. No one else can see it. No one will believe you. And two, the long-term horror. You will never, 
ever sleep again. You will never rest easy, even if you pass it on, this thing will inevitably come back to you when you least expect it. You can spend a lot of time considering this scenario, but for 99% of us, we are fucked in a situation like this. Fucked forever. There's also an element of guilt. Only a handful of people in their right minds are going to take this burden off you. For many people afflicted with the demon, their only choice is to pass it on to someone who has very much not signed up for it. Could you do that? Could you damn somebody else to death? Do you think that in your final moment, moments you would regret if you hadn't. Every time you see somebody walking towards you, you'll freeze with terror. Every knock at the door or noise at the window will have you running for your life. The rest of your lifespan will be spent looking over your shoulder, wondering when your time will come. That's the real torture of It Follows. The death is probably the easiest part, it's the waiting that kills you. And what's more is that a situation like this is going to bring out the worst in many of us, and that's exactly what It Follows explores. But how? It Follows is a story seeped heavily in metaphor. Maybe one metaphor, maybe more, set upon a dreamlike canvas. On a first watch, you might be so consumed with the goings-on that you barely notice the setting. In the same way that It Follows subverts all the standard expectations of horror movies, it also introduces us to, at first glance, the basic scenes and settings of any horror movie. The nameless American suburbia, where parents are simultaneously absent and right around the corner. The eerie void between being a school student and somehow being here, there and everywhere, or hours of the day. I like the dreamlike qualities of this movie. It's hard to describe, but It Follows feels one degree separated from reality, and it works for me, like an uncanny valley imitation of real life. Parents and adults are suspiciously absent, but are referenced by the characters throughout the movie, cultivating this weird omnipresence, but again an eerie physical absence. Time and space have a strange disconnection to them as they drive around to escape the creature. The rules of how the creature work are consistent, but are revealed slowly and in different ways. Despite being set in the 2010s, the characters all seem to be from entirely different eras in ways that are hard to explain. Like, that one girl has a shell phone. I don't know, it just felt like there was more under the surface that I missed. It was good. This weird dreamlike setting actually gets a bit silly when scares become contrived by characters being sat with their backs to bushes or crowds. Some of the weaker moments of the film revolve around this insistent horror character stupidity, but luckily they're not prevalent. But it all serves to create an atmosphere of vulnerability. What exactly the monster in It Follows represents is pretty hotly debated. There are a ton of theories for what exactly it's supposed to be and why, and while there is obviously a school of thought maintaining that it's just a monster, we don't need to think too deeply about it, I would argue that there's no fun in pretending that we don't write our own experiences. Horror and trauma are so closely interlinked that it is asinine to debate the alternative. The monster in It Follows may or may not have been developed with certain symbolism in mind, but it certainly exists regardless and let's explore it. The main theory I see when this film is discussed on any kind of surface level is that the monster represents sexually transmitted diseases, STDs. However, not only do I not believe this theory holds water whatsoever, but it's actually become a bit of a pet peeve of mine when I see people state it as fact. This monster's an STD, it represents STDs. No, it doesn't, and if you disagree with me, I'll see you in the car park. The demon is sexually transmitted, yes, but it's not a disease, it's just a demon, maybe even a curse. Firstly, the creature is only transmitted while you possess it. You can't have sex with 20 people and like queue them all up for the slaughter, it's a single entity that is passed from one person to the next. Moreover, most STDs are mild and or curable. I would hardly equate chlamydia to getting your body ripped apart and abandoned on a beach, and as for incurable STDs, I certainly don't think the monster of it follows represents anything along the lines of HIV or AIDS. Not only would that be a stunningly insensitive portrayal of a disease in a media landscape that already demonises it, but again, the monster doesn't operate similarly to HIV, which is an immunodeficiency disease that develops over years and isn't an especially aggressive one at first. Functionally, I don't think this demon can represent STDs, although I do understand why somebody might assume that it does. What's more is the moral implication. If the demon does represent STDs, this adds troubling implications to our associations of that with sex. Thanks. Our main character Jay is introduced to the Phantom by a gentleman who is at least generous enough to give her the lowdown. She understands thoroughly the predicament she's in, she knows what will happen if she passes it on, and she knows that, in her situation, she is basically forced to pass it on. She's a high schooler, she can't go running around the globe from this thing forever. 
If we follow this metaphor to its literal conclusion, we have an STD that has to be passed on, or else it will cause all hosts and all previous hosts to die. This means that not only is the host more or less forced to pass this on, but in the event that this host is a good person, they're going to need to sit somebody down and explain to them that they're going to suffer a gruesome fate in the event that they do engage in consensual sex, and that this person is going to have the comfort of intimacy ruined for them for the rest of their lives. This STD not only makes you a pariah, but an actively dangerous person to be around. It makes romance and love a dangerous, if not impossible, task, and it makes sex a detriment. It occupies your entire being. The more you consider it, the less it works, and I don't really vibe with this interpretation. Rather than taking a cursory glance and writing this off as an STD metaphor, it's important to start digging deep into the layers that the film presents to us, most specifically the subversions, the way this movie fucks with its audience. See, many horror movies tend to have one of two main casts. We have the attractive couple in the 30s with a huge family of children buying a suspiciously cheap house for their young family, and they have brainless horny teenagers who get picked off in gory ways. And It Follows initially does seem like the standard horror affair, furnished with the same old standard horror cast. We have a selection of attractive teenagers and a storyline that is punctuated by sex, and yet it subverts this trope so effectively, both for the characters and for us, the audience. In another director's hands, this could have been an opportunity to inject tons of like sexy, steamy, sexy sex scenes into the film. The kind of shit that peppers other horror films to various ends. They could have been indulgently voyeuristic with It Follows, and produced borderline pornography with all of the sex they were well within their rights to include, not just for the audience's titillation, but also to genuinely push the plot forwards. However, this isn't the angle that they decided to take. In It Follows, the sex is a means to an end every single time it's used in a scene, and I mean that in the most literal terms. It is awkward, uncomfortable, and dead-eyed. There is nothing enjoyable about watching the sex scenes in this movie. The closest thing we have to a genuine, honest-to-god, wank-bank sex scene is right at the beginning, when Jay meets a young man named Hugh. He takes her out on a date. She likes him, he seems to like her, he takes her out to the cinema and then for a milkshake, and then they drive out to some abandoned car park to clap cheeks. The scene takes takes place in his car, it's tastefully steamy, it's intimate, and it serves a dual purpose for Jay and for us watching. As the audience, we settle in for the classic horror flick where the first sex scene always results in our couple being murdered by some Jason-type killer, usually involving some altercation where the girl's top is ripped off and she bounces around before being unceremoniously, or I guess ceremoniously, depending on the film, murdered brutally. There's a monotony to sex in horror, which is a genre of extremes. It's so easy for horror imagery to creep into 18 ratings, so why not slap a bunch of sex in there too? Why not make it unreasonably awkward to have your parents walk in and you watching? The more serious horror flicks deny us sex scenes, yes, but any film featuring a bucket of silly fun and silly scares will have at minimum a topless scene. I feel like It Follows opens with the closest it can to sleaze in a bid to A, settle us in and watch us zone out to herald a sex scene between two characters that we don't care about yet, and B, expect trash. Only as we glaze over and watch these characters characters we don't know have sex in the car, something changes. As they finish and lie on the back seat, Hugh knocks Jay out so that he can deliver his warning and his instructions. This is an enormous subversion of expectations. Just like Jay has been lured into the situation of having romantic sex with someone she trusts, we have engaged with a trope we trust to carry us into the formative scenes of the movie, and we've both been betrayed by these expectations. There was no meaningful connection, no real love. It was deception and violation, and he has doomed her to die a horrible death. It's an effective way to suddenly switch up the pace of the film, having us on the back foot from the beginning just as Jay is. It's a violation both of Jay, literally, and of our expectations. He drops her off outside her house in her underwear, and she definitely looks like she's been through something severe. I mean, she has, but you know what I'm implying. We see echoes of this later in the film. After Jay's home is first broken into by the creature in the infamous tall guy scene, her friend Greg asks, what did Hugh really do to you, clearly in reference to sexual assault. After being attacked by the monster, it's jarring for Greg to call attention to that first instance with Hugh. Is the implication that the monster is her trauma returning? Is there something thematic to the monster breaking into her house without her consent or knowledge? Is this the haunting manifestation of the memory of what's happened, chasing her until it kills her? Still, I don't feel like this theory is entirely sound either. With the demon in her possession, Jay goes on to pass it to several more people. There's only one instance of a 
genuine selfish cruelty we see, where Jane notices a group of men on a boat out to sea. We see her staring at them for a long time in thought and consideration before taking her clothes off and swimming out to them. It's only after a cutaway that she is in her car, drenched from the swim, crying, and it is clear that she has put this demon on the men in the boat to buy herself what amounts to a mere few extra hours of life, presumably since she didn't warn them of what was going to happen. She has knowingly damned them to a painful sudden death, and you can see the guilt on her face as she drives away. The implications on the nature of that sexual encounter are laid extremely bare to us at this moment. This looks to be the moment where Jay is deciding and realising that she can't continue to do this every time she needs an extra day of safety. It's my belief that this is the moment that Jay realises that she is either going to die, she is either going to be killed by the monster, or she is going to give this to somebody who is happy to take it off her. Beyond the poor gents and that boat out to sea, two of Jay's encounters were with people who willingly consented, offering to take the creature from her to buy her more time, Paul and Greg, her friend and neighbour respectively. We'll cover these scenes in more detail later because I found them curious interpersonal moments, but beyond a loose hurt people hurt people metaphor, we're not seeing a situation in which Jay goes out to assault others to stave off her own death, and we can also see no difference in events when Jay passes the demon onto somebody who consents to it. There's no break in the curse, there's no difference. It's indiscriminate. All that matters is that a sexual encounter took place. Still, you could argue that it's selfish of Jay to pass this on, even to people who willingly consent to it, because the people she passes it on to are teenagers, and their capacity to grapple with their own imminent and violent murder is probably lesser than somebody a little bit older. The age of consent exists for a reason, most specifically because younger people lack a brain developed enough to truly understand consequences, and this can be exploited. Jay is a teenager herself, so this doesn't exactly apply in the same way as one might apply it to a 30 year old, but this lingering suggestion is still sitting below the surface and will probably never find a clear answer. Building from this we see a few more blocks fall into place. As demonstrated most explicitly by a later scene in It Follows, during which Jay lays parallel blades of grass along her thigh, mimicking self-harm scars, what follows her after that initial experience may well be trauma. Even if the monster isn't symbolic of sexual assault, and that theory is incorrect, what follows her genuinely is trauma incarnate. The monster of It Follows will always take the form of someone you know, albeit a little off, sometimes covered in blood, always oddly staring at you, completely fixated. Greg is killed by the the monster while it takes the form of his mother in a death that involves a lot of dry humping and a ton of what looks like semen everywhere. In the final confrontation, Jay is approached by it in the form of her father. That's a telling detail, more specifically because we see tons of versions of it across the film in tons of different disguises, but the only ones we are actually aware of are the parents of Jay and Greg. It was an especially insightful decision to have the monster be tangible and physical, just invisible. All of Jay's friends can make physical contact with the monster and see the effects the monster has on the world. It would be a much scarier entity if it could phase through doors and walls, or Jay's friends couldn't touch it, yet this monster has to break doors down and even ring the doorbell to get close to its prey. But no one can see it but Jay and the people in the queue before her. In a way, this could be a neat comparison for trauma. Nobody else can observe the lingering trauma and as a bystander to the situation, it can be difficult to understand why trauma follows somebody for so long. I'm sure we've all heard somebody say, you should be over this by now. For something, you're not quite sure why you can't get over yourself. And this is seen in the way that the entity follows Jay consistently, much to her friend's visible confusion. By the end of the film, all hands are on deck and her friends are supporting her to the best of their ability. In the final confrontation, Jay and her friends lure the entity to a swimming pool at night, surrounding the swimming pool with a ton of plugged in appliances. They intend to lure the creature into the water and then throw the appliances in to shock it, but they instead end up shooting it. Jay watches the blood billow out under the surface of the water before they leave, still unsure of whether the entity is dead. And it may well not be, it's certainly not implied to be, it demonstrates that while care alone doesn't solve the issue, the attempt they made collectively was ten times the magnitude of Jay's solo attempts to run away each time it resurfaced. They took some of the power back, even if they couldn't solve the problem. 
Still, this is also the point where the metaphor struggles. Jace still has to pass the entity along to a willing friend, no less, who then has to take that to a street corner to find a prostitute to pass it on to, hoping that she'll have often and consistent enough sex to keep this at bay. Assault is not cured by assaulting somebody else, yet nowhere in the outline of this curse does it specifically say that somebody needs to pass it on. Rather than live with it following her forever, Jay passes this on in an act of selfish self-preservation, as many of us would. She doesn't have to do this, lending some credence to the idea that a later visit from this creature would be karmic retribution for the lives that she's stolen in an attempt to keep hers going for even an extra few days a piece. Could it be possible, then, that the monster represents less of something purely of an inimical nature, and rather a raw, untamed force of nature that forces people to answer for their crimes. Because obviously anybody that is already aware that a monster is hunting them cannot have sex like a normal human being. The quandary here is just as much an ethical consideration as it is a death sentence. And that opens up its own questionable morality. Is the punishment for this just? Sure, Jay is added to the list and is going to die, but is it more righteous to face that death than it is to pass the buck onto somebody else? Yet, yeah, beyond all that, I have my own theories about It Follows. To me, the demon of It Follows represents the kind of inner demons you have to face when you are truly alone. It is the loud silence after a party, the empty ache of heartbreak, the stillness of an uneventful Saturday at the end of an uneventful week, its creeping insecurity, its self-destructive loneliness, its feelings that you run from only for them to catch up to you randomly, whether you like it or not. It's a feeling that isolates you from other people, an individual experience that only you face in the moment, something you can describe but can never truly show to somebody. I assume that's why it often embodies a form you recognise, such as with Greg's unfortunate end at the hands of his beer-breasted mother in a very gross scene that stuck with me. See, the sex of It Follows serves a purpose. We see a lot of debate in film as to whether or not sex scenes serve the plot, or whether they're just needless fan service and on-screen exploitation. And there's a lot of debate as to what serving the plot actually means, what it actually requires, whether it needs to be a distinct story beat that pushes characters from A to B, i.e. conceiving a child through the act of having sex, or whether serving the plot can simply be a demonstration of a relationship between two characters. The sex of It Follows literally serves a direct purpose, both for the story and for demonstrating the attitudes of these characters. Rather than serving as the bonding of two people who feel chemistry and attraction, it is the cold meshing of disinterested bodies, the feeling of literally plugging a void inside you with sex, never quite addressing the root cause. Towards the beginning of the movie, Jay is sitting in class as her teacher reads the T.S. Eliot poem titled The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Now, this poem is fairly long and I don't think I'd like to read the entire thing in this video, but to summarise, this is written from the point of view of a man who deeply desires romantic and sexual connection but can't communicate that desire and thus has to live his life without it. See, Prufrock is a variation on the dramatic monologue, a kind of poetry that requires three things to earn that label. One, it has to be a monologue of a character at a specific point in time. Two, the poem has to be directed towards an implied listener. And three, the focus is on like flesh out the character. It's basically a character study in poetry form. However, what's particularly noticeable about Prufrock is that it completely does away with the second requirement, that the poem has an implied listener. As implied by the way the poem is written, no one is listening to Prufrock talk about how lonely he is and how desperate he is for human connection, only embellishing these laments with a dramatic irony of their own. There's a short quotation before this poem, taken from Dante's Inferno, which intentionally describes Prufrock's ideal listener. He wants to be heard by somebody who is as lost as him and understands him completely. However, no such person exists. This mimics the distance between Jay, Greg and Paul respectively, despite each of them adopting this demon and having it follow them independently, leading to Greg's violent death, it's bizarrely not something that unites them. Passing the demon from one person to the next only seems to push them further apart from one another as they each become alienated from everyone around them in their own way. Despite entering into a relationship at the end of the film, Paul and Jay 
seem as estranged from each other as they would any stranger. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock also behaves as a mouthpiece of T.S. Eliot's fears of the modern age. He lived during the transition from the Victorian era of strict gender roles into the era where women began to step out of their domestic duties and sex began to be something that wasn't entirely taboo. This change made T.S. Eliot very uncomfortable. Many of his poems demonstrate a disdain for open sexuality, making this particular poet an interesting choice for a movie whose premise is based upon sex. Prufrock, the poem speaker, seems to be addressing a potential lover, with whom he would like to, to quote Spark Notes directly here, force the moment to its crisis by somehow consummating their relationship. Finally, we have our last theory. The monster in It Follows represents peer pressure, specifically that which surrounds sex and teenagers, and the harsh realities of succumbing to that peer pressure. There's one scene towards the start of the movie, around 24 minutes in, when Jay, freshly home after being dropped off by Hugh, is recovering from the trauma of what happened to her. The choice for many of the shots in this scene are notable, such as the fairly vulnerable shot of her on the bed, an intentional camera angle and body position above the covers in a pose of vulnerability. But the most interesting aspect of this cluster of scenes is the moment in the bathroom. Looking at herself in the mirror in a set of matching pure white underwear, a colour typically taken to represent cleanliness and purity, Jay pulls the elastic of her pants away from her hips and looks down into them. You see her breath quicken and she looks for a long while, but to us she looks normal. Conservative social fringe attitudes tend to see the loss of a woman's virginity in particular as a negative thing, and more specifically a negative physical change. Like when they say that like vaginas get looser the more sex you have, for example. Religion especially puts a lot of pressure on women to stay virgins for their future husbands, and your classic alpha bro podcast will happily shame women for having body counts, implying a dirtiness to a loss of virginity or an active sex life. A physical change that lowers a woman's value, Despite, as implied by the white underwear in the scene, no actual loss of self, she is still her. To me, this moment carried a lot of thematic weight. Furthermore, why does Jay refuse to tell her mum? It could merely be because she doesn't want her mum to know that she's having sex, but is there something more behind that, given the clearly metaphorical nature of the monster? Even after the monster breaks into the house, she's adamant that they cannot tell her mother. Why is that? Is the implication that she and Jay are so estranged that she literally cannot tell her mother what's happening? These questions are never answered within the film, and we can't really assume much beyond movie logic here. Yet the movie intentionally and repeatedly brings up the topic of Jay's parents, only to then consistently dismiss them and keep them out of the situation. The absence of parental support is especially significant being that the only people we see dealing with this monster are teenagers, people who are not remotely well equipped to handle this. They are stapled to their home and their parents, their neighbourhood and their schools. Some business mogul could just fly to a new scrap of land every two weeks and outrun this thing forever, but a teenage girl living with her parents in the suburbs? Not a chance. Notably, Jay's experience is entirely without support. We'll discuss this a little bit later, but the omission of parents and police in this movie is very deliberate. Yes, they are physically present at moments, but for example, Jay's mother is only depicted from her eyes upwards, blurred out of the scene so that the focus can be on some photographs behind her. The police are present to search the car park for clues after Jay's kidnap, but no police are present or interested when Jay crashes her car and ends up in the hospital, or Paul shoots Jay's friend in the leg, nor any other moment of literal crime. Intimacy is thematically present in almost every scene too. For example, when they go to Hugh's house, we see porn magazines with a bunch of tissues on top of them. We also see a scene featuring the focus on Jay's feet on the sofa, touching Paul's feet. Focus was put on this shot. Intimacy is present in all of their conversations, such as when they confide, you were my first kiss, you know, or do you remember the time we found those porno magazines? It had me wondering whether the peer pressure symbolised by the monster was affecting Jay, or whether it was affecting Paul. We've mentioned Paul a few times before, and now it's time to properly discuss him. Paul, while well-intentioned, is the kind of guy who just kind of lingers around Jay because he fancies her. Paul is smitten, and while I don't want to be presumptuous, take this with a grain of salt based on my own anecdotal experiences, he seems like the kind of guy who would not be in her life if he didn't also hope that he could get into her pants. He lusts after Jay, and she doesn't care for him whatsoever. They have zero chemistry. Paul is fairly silent throughout the movie, but we can see how physically attractive 
attracted he is to Jay, who is not fussed on him whatsoever. Instead, he resentfully watches her pass this demon along to Greg first, and the strangers in the boat, all while staring at her lustfully and limply trying to kiss her. Even when Greg fucking dies, Paul is incapable of thinking of anything other than sleeping with Jay. Jay is clearly aware that his desire to help is illusory, as demonstrated by her pulling away when he leans in for a kiss, and instead looking over at Greg's house. She knows what Paul wants, and while she's probably aware that this makes him an option to pass the demon along to if she were to be selfish, she might also be frustrated by his insistent attempts at getting into her pants while she is grappling with her immediate mortality. They do end up having sex at the end of the film, and Paul now has the monster. In the penultimate scene, he drives by a pair of prostitutes, and it is presumed that he passes the monster onto them. I have always assumed that he does, but it's not quite confirmed. Let's assume that he doesn't, and ask why not? This would be an easy way to put some distance between him and the monster, but maybe he doesn't do it. It's only implied that he stops by them. On first glance, it's easy to say that it's because it would be wrong to do such a thing, but would that stop him? He pressured Jay to have sex with him for the entirety of the movie. If he did indeed actually bow out from having sex with these prostitutes, could it be that the reason he didn't have sex with them has more to do with how he views sex than how he views the monster? One of my favourite aspects of It Follows is the way that it approaches sex and sexual relationships through the medium of film. As I mentioned before, this movie could have been wantonly lecherous in its depiction of sexuality, and yet it opted for awkward, uncomfortable, robotic interactions between people who only grow further apart through the act of having sex with each other. Now, as I said before, there are three major sex scenes in It Follows. The first is with Hugh, which we've discussed in depth, but the second sex scene arrives at the halfway point of the movie, and this occurs between Jay and her neighbour Greg. After a car accident has left her bedridden in hospital, staring at the door in restless terror every waking minute, Greg offers to take it off her hands. This way he can go out and drive around and be safe and alive and Jay can rest in hospital, which is a good deal I suppose. What follows is the coldest, driest, deadest sex scene in cinema history. While Jay at first seems like she's enjoying it, uttering a few rehearsed moans, she quickly just kind of stops and lies flat. Sex is no longer something that she can enjoy, but it seems pretty evident that Greg is <laughs> making the most of this. Go Greg, no judgement. This is two people getting a job done. The sexual equivalent of holding a ladder up for someone. This marks the point in the story where sex becomes a tool for Jay's survival. Enjoyment is no longer part of the equation, and who could possibly enjoy sex now, knowing that the queue will be stacking up behind them? And quick note, but I did wonder for a while why Greg died so easily. The entity literally walks up to his front door, lets itself in, and murders him in his room. I was like, Greg, were you not on high alert? And then as I was writing this, I flashed back to a scene where Paul was disapprovingly watching Greg put an arm around a girl shortly after having sex with Jay in the hospital. Paul clearly finds this act of public affection distasteful, and I assumed this was due to his own lecherous little possessive feelings about Jay, which clouded my judgement of the moment. I feel like it's actually because he's realised that Greg is going to have sex with this girl and pass the demon onto her, which definitely explains why he doesn't expect the monster to come and find him so quickly, and hence his tragically avoidable death. Depending on the context, having sex with a girl while she's in hospital and then dipping to have sex with someone else could be considered distasteful. However, for Paul, who believes himself to be deserving of Jay, might consider this to be undeserving behaviour. Hell, maybe Paul doesn't even fully believe Jay yet. Maybe he's weird enough to assume this is some kind of weird lie that Jay has made up to justify having sex with somebody that isn't him. Damn, took me three watches to realise that. That scene is important. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the deaths themselves could be a metaphor. If this monster represents something, it's also possible that the deaths by this monster represent something. For example, in the movie Talk To Me, the hand clearly refers to a drug and how drugs can take lives. In this sense, the deaths at the hand, no pun intended, are the object of a metaphor for drug overdoses. In It Follows, this is most obviously seen in the HIV AIDS metaphor, but it, it doesn't make a lot of sense there. In this light, the entire movie 
can be seen as a metaphor for something, an abstract representation. I feel like I'm mostly just describing the concept of interpretation here, but hopefully you get what I'm putting down. Rather than a literal death, the deaths could represent the end of a relationship, or something of that nature if that makes sense, or, although that could fall apart upon closer examination. What lends credence to that is that when the monster kills Greg, she is humping him and seems to orgasm. They are holding hands, there's not everywhere, it's a very intimate death. Anyway, our third and final sex scene is without a doubt the hardest one to watch, but thematically is my favourite one for the meaning it conveys. Paul finally gets his wish. With a cheer against the door, Jay climbs on top of him and they have sex. So as the movie begins to draw to a close, Paul basically, so generously, offers his penis to Jay. He's like, oh, come on then, if you have to have sex with someone, you may as well have sex with me. And this sex feels transactional. While Paul does express care about Jay, I don't think he cares deep down as much as he thinks he does. This sex is passionless, underwhelming, and devoid of connection. I can't put into words how watered down this sexual encounter is. Jay smiles a little bit, like I guess she's making the most of the situation, but ultimately this encounter is so hard to watch. I always have to look away, this is just abundantly not right. I guess the downside of exploring a story like this in a high school setting is that we have to watch a lot of weird, awkward teenagers having sex, and the older I get, obviously the weirder I find things like that, but in this movie it serves very effectively, because this uncomfortable voyeurism adds to the difficult nature of the sex scenes, that were already intentionally framed as awkward and uncomfortable. Jay goes along with it because she is broken by fear and the weight of the experiences she's had to face already, but even despite the implications of passing this demon on, it feels like she is giving in to a degree. Like dating somebody you don't like that much because it's better than being single, Jay ends up in a relationship with Paul that doesn't fulfil her just to have a buffer between her and the demon walking the earth. In their final scene, they walk through the neighbourhood together in silence, holding hands, and while there's a literal aspect to this, the previously mentioned fear of what is lurking right around the corner, there is a silent unhappiness between them, potentially as Paul realises he wasn't that interested in Jay romantically in the first place, but is now stuck in the chain of walking death, and as Jay resigns herself to a situation she is unhappy in, in order to protect herself from the inevitable. It Follows is a good film, and one that rewards multiple rewatches despite having no major twists, turns, or reveals of any kind. It's just that deep, there's just so much going on. It's an experience entirely wrapped up in metaphor, of many different kinds. It Follows feels like a dream that can be picked apart and understood on multiple levels, with meaning that is going to impact each person differently. As October draws to a close, I have to recommend It Follows if you're looking for a nice spooky flick, since it's also just a brilliant movie. You can just watch this and enjoy it at face value too. So first of all, I wanted to thank my friend Adam Washington for helping me write this script. Adam Washington is an independent novelist based in the United States. He's an extremely clever guy, and he helped me break down some of the analysis a little bit better and give me some insights and some perspectives that I hadn't myself considered. Please go and support him, I'll post the link to his stuff in the description below, read his book. Secondly, I wanted to thank my patrons for their support. I got laid off this week. I, I lost my job. Um, it was... It was very stressful. I mentioned it on Twitter, a few people subbed on Patreon to give me some support and I was, I, I could have cried, like sincerely, I, I could have sobbed. My Patreon is in the link below. And again, thank you so much to patrons for their support. I, I could not do this without you. And a specific massive thank you to Alice Teeters, Brian Bullock, Bail Hamaho Footh, Brendan Sidereal, Brody Cullen, Carl DeRocher, Fosh, Heidi, HM, Julia, and Sam Jones for being my highest tier patrons. I really appreciate you guys, thank you so much. I'll be streaming a lot more now that I've lost my job before I get my next job, so make sure to hop over to my Twitch channel and check that out, and thank you very much to Surfshark for sponsoring me in my time of need. I specifically organised this sponsorship with Francis. Thank you, Francis. You are the GOAT. You are my favourite. With that, thank you very much for watching, everybody. Have an amazing week, have an amazing weekend, have an amazing Halloween, and I'll see you in the next one.